Good morning. It's good to see you. And we love your presence. We love your presence. You're so kind. We love your presence. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find home in you. You are our dwelling place for all generations. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God. Holy are you. Beautiful is your heart towards us. We recognize your humility today. You've drawn near to us, your beloved. It is you whom we have come to seek. Our heart says, seek his face. Your face, O oh Lord, will we seek. We've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. Our lips have and will glorify you. We will praise you as long as we shall live. And in your name, we will lift our hands. And our souls shall be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, our mouths will praise you. Oh God, you are our God. And earnestly we seek you. Our souls thirst for you. Our bodies long for you. Our bodies long for you. We invite you to arise to your resting place, O Lord, to come in your mercy, to come in your power, to establish the year of your favor and the day of vengeance upon your foes. In according with the desires of your heart, let your word come in power today. Let it come in hope and in mercy and liberation for captives, we pray. The words of wisdom, not of man, we pray. And Holy Spirit, we give you full permission. As we yield ourselves again to Jesus, we give you full permission to do in us and with us all that you chose today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 7. I think that's where we are today. And um, while you're turning there, just to update on the conversation that we've been in over the last couple of weeks. Um, I'll just pull this up here. But the, the conversation that we've been in over the last couple of weeks on uh, really bringing freedom and cleansing and healing to our lives. And the increase of that is uh, something we just desire for every person in our community and, of course, in our church uh, with that too. <laughs> so while you're turning there, let me I just thought of this again during worship. This is an old prayer. It's a prayer-filled declaration. It was uh, written by an African brother at a time of real desperation in his life. And I'm going to read it out today. Maybe you'll want to close your eyes as you do, as I do that. Uh, but maybe next week we could say this together when we, I think, next week we'll conclude our series on cleansing and freedom. Uh, but let me just pray, read this over us, and uh, maybe just close your eyes, open your heart, or keep your eyes open. As long as your heart is open, that's, that's the key. It says this, I am relentless. I'm not going to sleep around, fool around, or mess around. I am relentless. I'm tired of waffling, and I'm finished with wavering. I am relentless. I refuse to waste any more time or energy on shallow living, petty thinking, useless regretting, or hurtful resenting. I am relentless. I know what matters most, and I'll give it all I've got. I'll do the best that I can with what I have for Jesus Christ today. I am relentless. I won't be captivated by culture, manipulated by critics, motivated by praise, frustrated by problems, defeated by temptation, or intimidated by the devil. When times get tough and I get tired, I won't back off, back up, back down, back out, or backslide. I'll just keep moving forward by God's grace. 
I'm spirit-led and mission-focused, so I cannot be bought, I will not be compromised, and I shall not quit until I finish the race. And to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I say, however, whenever, wherever, and whatever you ask me to do, my answer in advance is yes. Wherever you lead and whatever the cost, I'm ready anytime, anywhere, anyway. Whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it takes, I am relentless. And I want to be used by you in such a way that on that final day, I'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful one. Come on in and let the eternal party begin. <laughs> it's just such a good declaration, isn't it? I am relentless. My goodness, could that have been spoken over Jesus? You'll know that we've been going through the gospel of Mark together. We're now in Mark chapter 7. And Jesus is utterly relentless in his obedience to the Father, in his dismantling the works of the enemy. And in this moment, we're going to pick up a story where he's retreated for a little while just to gain some rest. Uh, but this morning's all about freedom and cleansing and healing and deliverance and all those good things that come with the king and his kingdom. And just a little bit of background in that. A few years ago in 2019, the father began to speak to her staff and say this, I'm going to bring the back room of the church into the front room. And uh, that meant a number of things for us. Partly it meant that youth and young people were going to take center stage. Partly for us, it meant repentance. The Lord was saying the things that people have been hiding in the back room of their homes, I'm going to begin now to expose and I'm going to begin to cleanse. And um, we went into a period of significant confession together as a house. And many of you recall those uh, gatherings in 2019 where people would just find a space anywhere in the floor and weep before the Lord. Uh, but it also meant for us that some of the ministries that church had grown awkward around and growing uncomfortable around were going to be restored front and center in the house of God. And part of that ministry is deliverance, people being set free. And uh, we believe, and I believe, that these are new days of deliverance. God is restoring the ministry of deliverance in his church. These are new days of deliverance. There are new dimensions of deliverance available. And I believe there's new depths of deliverance. We're going to see that today in the passage that we look at. But I realize for many of us, that subject itself can be a little bit perplexing, a little bit confusing. And I, I just want to, I, I don't want to make us comfortable in this, but I want to ensure that we're biblical in it. I don't think there's any way really you can be comfortable around Jesus. Jesus is the most unpredictable person you could possibly know, right? Entirely loving and faithful and covenantal, but completely, you never know with Jesus what he's going to do. Uh, he, he just, sometimes he says to the people that we think are in the right, he calls them to repentance and he loves sinners and tax collectors. You're like, mind blown. You never quite know with him. Um, but we do want to follow his pattern when it comes to freedom and cleansing and wholeness and deliverance. And what Jesus said was this. He said this, if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is upon you. If I cast out demons by the spirit of God, kingdom of God is upon you. And that tells me this, that Jesus drove out demons by the Spirit of God. He didn't do it by formula. He didn't do it by methodology. He didn't do it by listening to the demons and learning what they thought. He did it by the Spirit of God. That's how he cast out demons. In fact, when we read the Gospels, and we're going to center on Mark today as we have all year, when we read the Gospels, it's kind of surprising how it begins to unfold because we see pretty quickly there's no pattern to this. There's no pattern to driving out demons. Sometimes Jesus drives out multiple demons, like a legion of demons in Mark chapter 6, 5. Mark chapter 5. Other times it's a single demon. Sometimes he has conversations with family members, and we'll see that next week. He starts talking to the dad. Sometimes there's no conversation. Sometimes he asks the demon its name. Sometimes he doesn't care what the name of the demon is. Sometimes the people come looking to him. Sometimes... It just happens wherever he happens to be. He's walking along and people at the end of Mark uh, 6 are being released in that. And there's no clear formula or pattern. Sometimes the degree of demonization, and remember we said last week, this is as a believer, we cannot be possessed by a demon. That we are belong to Christ. We are positioned in his righteousness and in his mercy and in his covenant. So you can't be possessed by a demon. But we talked about how it's very clear that we can all be influenced 
whether enticing or controlling or influencing or oppressing or tormenting or troubling, all those things can happen to believers and unbelievers. So here's what I've uncovered a little bit in my journey through this. And what I'd love for you to do is actually go away over the next month and a half or something. You go through the Gospel of Mark. Maybe you could go through each of the Gospels. But you come up with your conclusions around what biblical deliverance looks like. Because very often we're guilty when it comes to deliverance of doing what's just happened in the passage before, exalting our traditions above his voice. We hear of things that work elsewhere and we start making those traditions around deliverance. But actually you're always safest when you're biblical, right? Can we agree we want to be supernatural and scriptural? Yes, can we, can we agree on that? We want to be both, right? So here's, here's some of them, and uh, they may or, or may not come up. The common denominator in every deliverance is the presence and voice of Jesus. And the common takeaway is the recognition of his righteous authority. People are like, this guy has authority. Two, we see as we read the Gospel of Mark that Jesus never went looking for demons. Usually the people came to him for help and the demon manifest in front of him. Thirdly, Jesus never focused on the activity of the enemy. He never began his days wondering what the devil was doing, where the devil was hiding, where he was lurking. That just was not his priority. What Jesus did is he gave himself to the proclamation of the kingdom and the release of the captive. And it's clear that when Jesus ministered the kingdom, so whenever he just focused on that, that sometimes deliverance was essential. And again, we'll see that. These are just my conclusions. Sometimes delivering people from demons was the confirmation of the message. In other words, Mark 16, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. That's the confirmation of the message. Sometimes it was the practical application of the message. If we talked about generosity and we said, now we're going to give, when you talk about the kingdom, the practical application is to say, this person is no longer under the rule and reign of the enemy. A new kingdom has come, overthrows the rule of the enemy and let that kingdom be established. It's just the practical deliverance. It's just the practical outworking of the kingdom. I would add to that, and um, you might want to do, it is impossible to proclaim the kingdom and not end up somehow driving out darkness. That if we're going to proclaim the kingdom, we're going to come against the opposite kingdom. It's just going to happen. Um, Four, we see that deliverance often happened publicly in religious gatherings. That should make us aware of that in church. And within that, Jesus' priority was never the dignity of the individual. Never. Like, never. The priority was always the release of the captive. And again, we want to be biblical, not psychological. Right? If, if somebody is getting free from a demon, it doesn't water, ma- matter what their makeup looks like. He can wear whatever he wants. Right? It doesn't matter. Five, deliverance was not a hidden ministry, but an important ministry. At least to Jesus. Nowhere, number six, nowhere does Jesus say the person was at fault for being demonized. And one of the traps of the enemy is to to trap people in darkness, then make them ashamed for the darkness that he brings so that they're afraid. And they're even afraid of what would happen if they got set free and what people would think of them afterwards. And he like, so he traps them on the way in, he traps them from getting free and he traps them on the way out. It's just what he does. But you need to know not once did Jesus look at someone and say, it's your fault you're demonized. And forgive me if I just pointed at you. Um, But not once does Jesus do that. Incidentally, neither does he ask them how they came to be demonized. It's not important to him. He doesn't go looking for all the inroads and outcomes and all that. It's just not in the Bible. Right? We can can say it's in culture. We can say it's in biblical, uh, in Christian books. But we cannot claim it's biblical. Which is not to say it's unbiblical. It's just to say it's extra biblical. Are we okay? Yep. Number seven, (laughs) we understand from Mark that Jesus had a worldview of Satan and demons and saw his continued mission to drive out demons. When he was heading to the cross and um, his people were like, oh my goodness, this is getting hard. And uh, they came to him and he said, you go tell that fox Herod, I drive out demons today and tomorrow. And then the third day I reach my goal. It's like, I'm going to heal the sick and I'm going to drive out demons. It's just what I do. And it's what the king has always done. From Pharaoh in Egypt all the way through the New Testament to today. I forget which number we got. It's probably a demon making me forget. I'm joking. 
All right, we know that some demons were harder to remove or expel than others. The one today is a really interesting one, and the one we'll look at next week is the opposite. Uh, number nine, we don't have a record of Jesus ever teaching on expelling demons. He never held a class on, here's how you cast out demons from a person. He just did it, right? Which is not to say that he didn't do that. It's just to say the Bible doesn't tell us that. Which is not to say again that it's wrong. It's just to say, hey, Jesus never did. He just dealt with it as it came up. And that's how he went about what he did. Um, so for sure, there's no one, here's how to drive out demons model. Right? There's no singular, here's how you drive out darkness from a person's life model. They can't be, because Jesus operates in multiple models. Are we still good? Yep. I forget which number we're on. Which number are we? Ten. Ten. We do know that he commissioned and expected his followers to drive out demons. In fact, that's the thing he tells them again and again and again and again and again. Drive out demons, drive out demons, drive out demons. All the way through Mark's gospel, every time he equips them and sends them, his first words are, go drive out demons. I've given you authority, go do this. <clears throat> Number 11, we know that they did so at times with various degrees of effectiveness. Again, come next week. Uh, I, I was reading Martin Luther King this week, and he has this wonderful chapter in his book, uh, Strength to Love, which uh, is this. Why could we not cast it out? And we're going to lean into that a little next week because that's Mark chapter 9. Why couldn't we drive it out? What, what was missing in that? And so sometimes they just couldn't do what they were supposed to do. And number 12, but we know that they never stopped. And so they just kept giving it a go wherever they went. So we're going to dive into one of those moments. Is that a helpful biblical overview for you? Right. Go do your own study in it. Don't take, certainly don't take my word for it, but please don't take somebody else's word online for it. Go read the Bible, right? So that's all I'm asking you to do. Just please read the Bible. And if you see it in the Bible, it's fair game, right? But if you don't, be really aware of that and just be aware it's extra biblical, but it may or may not be helpful. He never once asked if there was a Freemason spirit, but people got free, right? But there may well be a Freemason spirit, but just you don't have to go looking for it every single time, right? At least Jesus didn't. You say, well, the Masons weren't around there. If they had been, he would have. I hear you. <laughs> the stone the Masons rejected. <laughs> okay. All right. Verse 24, enough of the shenanigans. No, verse 24. Jesus left that place and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. This is outside of Israel. That's important for what happens next. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. And yet he could not keep his presence a secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed, remember the better translation there is demonized, by an impure spirit, came and she fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, that's important, born in Syria. Uh, Syrian Phoenicia, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. So what do we have here? We have three things. Firstly, we have an absent father. We're not told why he's absent. We're not told, is he dead? Is he just unbothered? We're, but he is absent. He's absent from the scenario. And we understand that actually it would have been his responsibility to seek healing for his family, right? But he's absent too. We have a tormented daughter. This woman is desperate. She comes begging is the word there. And three, we have a desperate mother. A desperate mother. Just doing whatever she can. Uh, Matthew, when he tells this story, he's like, there's this delay in the woman's request and the disciples are not at all helpful in it. And you have this picture of this person in the only place on the planet where she can find hope for her family. And she's unsure how to pursue as her family is stripped, robbed, and taken apart by the works of the enemy. And it's the mom fighting for the future of the family and the dad isn't in the picture. But he could be dead. That's important to know. So she begs Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And I don't know about you, but this kind of throws up some stuff, particularly psychologically for us, right? Uh, what the Bible seems to be suggesting here is you have a kid that has a demon. Would you agree? That's what it seems to be suggesting. And for most of us, we're like, don't be daft, right? Don't be daft. How could a kid have a demon? 
And I think partly this is because you remember last week we talked about all the different sins that we commit and they become patterns in our life and pathways and powers then rest on those. Well, people become demonized in two different ways. One is the sin that they commit, but also the sins that are done against them. Molestation, abuse, abandonment, neglect. In fact, and we're going to pray into this at the end together today. In fact, many of us are most wounded in our childhood are most severely impacted by the enemy in our childhood. Many of our deepest wounds happen there. Rejection, anger, neglect, exposure to terror. I still remember my mother uh, most nights watching Hammer House of Horrors and me as an eight-year-old watching those things. Like just subjected to things that children wouldn't normally choose. Alcoholic parents, angry father, adultery in the marriage creates a wound in a child's heart. Divorce creates a wound in a child's heart. And again, there's no guilt attached to that, which is important we recognize it. Severance of covenant, anxiety and addiction. All of these things create wounds. In fact, that's where the whole therapy industry has grown up around this thing. What's one of the first questions you'll be asked by a therapist? Anyone go, to, this is Orange County, this is therapy central, people. What's, the, what's one, let's not pretend you don't do it. What's one of the key questions? Yeah. Tell me about your childhood. Why? Because they know that your emotional disturbance relates to something in your childhood most of the time. Well, it's the same with a spiritual disturbance, right? It's often located in that area. And then we can add to those sibling rivalry and jealousy, parental sins, generational sins, ancestral worship. Dedication of the child, if you were taking it to the stream, dedication of the child to wrong things, just as we dedicate our children to Christ. And so, uh, and so today we're going to pray for freedom into many of those areas. We're going to believe that the Holy Spirit by His presence and power will set us free from some of the things that therapy hasn't yet. And we're going to believe uh, for releasing that. So again, this is just helping us think through those things and laying a foundation. How many of you believe that our kids don't get a junior Holy Spirit? Right? We, we believe that here. We teach that. In fact, you just heard stories this week of healing and all that. That happens every week. My goodness. Karn is a legend. Karn, Karn is like, he's just a legend. We believe that. Uh, the bad news is they don't get junior demonic spirits either. In fact, come next week and you'll see that the demon, this kind that only comes out by prayer and fasting, is afflicting a child. So the idea that the strongest demons would be for adults is just not biblical. And partly I believe, and I can't prove this biblically, but partly I believe that is because the enemy, if he can screw up a kid, he can have them for life, right? He can stop the purpose of God in their life. But we don't know. We don't know how the the daughter came to be demonized. What we do know is that they were demonized. Jesus at no point corrects the woman's understanding. He doesn't say, don't be, don't be foolish, don't be silly. This is just behavioral. This is just emotional. This is just hormonal. This is chemical imbalance. He does not try to appease the anxiety of the mother's heart with psychology when the problem is demonic. Can we agree? That's just biblical. I'm not saying anything unbiblical here. Can we, I just need to hear you say it. Yes. Right? You agree? That's the truth, right? Jesus, in fact, we know that later because he says the demon has left your daughter. So very clearly, Jesus believed there was a demonic spirit at work. Can we agree? Yes. Yes. Good, good, good. (laughs) He says the demon has left your daughter. And he's about to bring freedom, but before that happens, there's a covenant conversation. And it's really important because for us, it feels a little bit awkward and a little bit insensitive and maybe even deeply offensive. So we have this conversation that drives theologians mad and they try to do all kinds of theological and spiritual gymnastics to make Jesus seem nice. Remember, Jesus is not nice, but he is kind. Jesus is not nice, but he is kind. Nice people keep everybody happy. Jesus offended lots of people. Jesus is not nice, but he is kind. Remember that he's kind in this conversation. He says this to us. The woman's there. She's desperate. He says this. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. He 
anybody else just shocked by that? He's already said, my family's in torment and trouble. I'm here honoring a Jew who I despise. I despise the Jewish nation. I'm here. Those people despise the Jews. I'm here pouring my dignity out at your feet, listening to your impotent followers. And Jesus says to her, hey, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> it doesn't really fit our Western mindset, does it? It doesn't feel at all comforting. Anyone comforted by that kind of Jesus? Anyone slightly disturbed, right? It's not comforting at all. Here's what we would do. We would seek to promote relational connection. We would seek to preserve psychological well-being. We would seek to say, oh my goodness, your heart must be broken. How you must be suffering as a family. What is going on with you? And we would seek to enter in, we call it empathy. Listening skills. Are we still here? Yeah. That's what we would do. A parent is in pain. Her daughter's in bondage. She comes for healing. It's what we would all do. But what I want to say today is this, that Jesus always has kind conversations, but he always has covenant conversations with those who come to him. And we're going to see here that this is a covenant conversation. This is a conversation around righteousness and where someone stands in relation to covenant and where they stand in relation to the king and his kingdom. And he says, it is not right. You remember, Mark has already told us and Matthew also tells us that when Jesus gets baptized, why does he get baptized? Because he's unclean? Why does he get baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. There's a kingdom order to righteousness. It must be fulfilled. Jesus acted firstly in agreement with the old covenant before introducing the new covenant. There's an order to righteousness. There's an order to covenant. And sometimes what we do, and we don't mean to, but sometimes what we do with people is we neglect covenant in order to bring comfort. We're having politically correct conversations, emotionally intelligent conversations, but deeply irrelevant conversations with people. And they're left in their bondage and they're left in their pain because we're afraid of upsetting them while introducing the king and his kingdom. And we win the applause of men with such approach and they're not disturbed at all by it. In fact, they think we're brilliant, but we ignore the righteousness of heaven when we engage with that posture. Jesus was never anthropocentric, big theological word, in his dealings with people. He always started with what is the Holy Spirit doing here? Are we still here? If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, I only do whatever I see my father doing, right? The cornerstone of this house. So we know he wasn't led by emotion. We know he wasn't led by false compassion. We know he wasn't led by desperation. Didn't matter how desperate the person got, there was an order to Jesus' actions and that order was according to righteousness. This is why he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Righteousness. Many people think deliverance is only an aspect of the kingdom, but it's not only an aspect of the kingdom, it's a demonstration of the righteousness of God. God putting things right. Across the Western church, I believe, we're hosting the wrong conversations. Not in Africa, not in Asia. They have these conversations all the time in those contexts. But in the Western church, we're hosting the wrong conversations. We're not talking to people about repentance. We're not talking to them about judgment. We're not talking to them about freedom. We're having conversations largely rooted in psychology, bereft of scripture, and worse, baptizing scripture in psychology. It is disgusting. It is disgusting because it's a false hope for people. There is no hope in psychology baptized by Bible. There's only hope for people baptized in God, in his nature, in his freedom, in his wholeness, which is not to demean the psychological realm. We all need it. It's useful to us. It's just not very helpful to us as it relates to righteousness. In other words, it's good to know that you are wounded and it's good to know how to be healed of your wound. It's good to know how to talk to your boss. It's not particularly helpful when your boss is demonized and praying against you. <laughs> no amount of your understanding and self-awareness can help you in that moment. Yeah. 
And what we've done, and we don't mean this, and I'm saying this a lot more gentle than I wrote it, uh, but what we've done is we have replaced, we have replaced political correctness and cultural awareness. We've, we've replaced the gospel with those things. And today we're more concerned about being canceled by culture than we are about living as crucified with Christ. How can we possibly be crucified with Christ if we're afraid of being canceled in culture? How can we possibly just quote those Bible verses? How can we even say those Bible verses? I am crucified with Christ, but terrified of being canceled in culture. It is ridiculous, but a psychological church has convinced us to live in that duality, and that is a false duality. We claim, we claim, and you guys are good, so hear me. I'm going to go passionate here, but it's just because this stuff burns in. We claim to represent Christ to the world, but we will not get on our cross. Because it's bloody and people don't like a mess. Because it's unrecognizable and people need to understand what's going on. And we do many things like this. We have our traditions in the church. And the worst thing, the worst thing is this. Today, the church as a whole, and God forbid that it ever spreads to our African brothers and our Asian brothers and sisters, but the church of God as a whole is in the grip of a psychological spirit masquerading as the Holy Spirit. Doing whatever it takes to attract people and appease people rather than introducing them to Christ and his hope and his freedom and his righteousness and deliverance. We must come back to the book. We must come back to the book. We must come back to the hope in that. We teach people how to manage their problems instead of deal with their sin. I don't want to go on. I know, I know, there's, I know there's me in the room in this, and I, I don't want to go on that, but I do want to just say a couple more things in that. We have, we have brought emotions into the center of the church so that believers, the average believer, is led by their emotions. In a world that only teaches at the emotional level. In a church that only teaches at the emotional level. Bereft of the spirit. Literally bereft of the spirit. The soul now running the church. And if you don't think that's true, and I'm not being aggressive in this, but if you don't think that's true, ask yourself how many talks you've heard on emotionally healthy spirituality in the last five years and how few on deliverance. How many are designed to help you and your family and how many were designed and wired around the king and his kingdom? Friends, Jesus only taught one of those things. He didn't say, go into the, all the world and teach them to live a balanced lifestyle with emotionally healthy spirituality at the core. He said, go into all the world, drive out demons. That's my commission. That's the only place you have authority. Others will like you if you choose the former. You will be well liked, but so were the prophets, the false prophets before you. Which I know sounds really harsh, doesn't it? You're like, oh, flip, I feel like the women now with Jesus. What am I saying? I'm saying we've ignored covenant. We've ignored covenant. And the Bible is a book of covenant. We sang it. Thank you. Oh, thank you for breaking the bread of your body. The Lord Jesus in the night he was betrayed took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. He said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the wine after supper. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. Is the new covenant. And because we're no longer under the old covenant does not mean we're no longer covenant people. We're in a new covenant and that covenant is built upon the king and his righteousness. And we have a church today all across the U.S. ignorant of his righteousness while the charismatics alone pretty much proclaim his kingdom. I hope you can hear the gentleness in my heart. But we must return to covenant. And so Jesus brings this woman back to this. Let me say this. I, I don't believe that all is lost. I have hope for the future that the church will arise again as a covenant people 
that God himself will own his church again, that Father will be Father in his own house and King in his own kingdom, that we will not supplant them with any false ruler any longer. I have belief burning in my bones that there will be again a church of purity and of power, that we don't have to run to one or the other, but we can have both. I believe there'll be a church that arises again in renewal and repentance, that we will hear the sounds of laughter as God's renewal sweeps over people and the sounds of weeping as repentance comes upon them. I believe that there will be again a people of righteousness and reverence. I love it. I've said this to you so many times, but I love it in worship when it's like this morning, there's such extravagance. And then in a moment, His holiness comes and there's so much reverence in the room. And I want to be part of a people who know what it is to be passionate about Jesus, but absolutely pure hearted in their pursuit of Him. But how can reverence be restored to the church without the deliverance ministry? It's impossible. Acts 19 shows us that it's impossible. Acts 5 illustrates it also. It's when the power of the Lord comes and the fear of the Lord and deliverance and cleansing comes that the fear of the Lord begins to touch the hearts of his people. Are you doing okay? Do we have a little while longer? (laughs) Eight of us do. (laughs) Let me show you how this is a covenant conversation. He says it's not right. It's not right. We need to know that Jesus will not release his kingdom without righteousness. People will, teachers will, preachers will, but Jesus never releases his kingdom without righteousness. That's why at the end of the day, many will come and say, Lord, in your name, did we not cast out demons and heal the sick and prophesy? He'll say, you didn't do it in my name. I didn't know you. There was no righteousness there. You you practiced the act of the kingdom without the righteousness at the center. There was no intimacy in what you were doing. So it is possible to proclaim the kingdom and practice it without righteousness, but Jesus brings it back to a righteous conversation. Matthew's gospel tells us that he actually says to the woman, hey, I'm here for the Jews because that's the truth. To the Jews, first of all, belong the covenants. Paul writes this in Romans, uh, I believe it's chapter nine, to the theirs is the covenant or chapter 10. So the first covenant is with the Jews. The gospel must come to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. That is the kingdom order. The Jewish nation were chosen by God at that time to represent his will and demonstrate his righteousness on the earth. He would have a people separated to himself. This is your basic Bible. They were separated to himself and he was going to raise them up as a model for the nations. But of course, we know the story. They never lived that way. And the father speaks from heaven. He says, son, it's too small a thing for you only to redeem the Jews. You're going to redeem all nations in Isaiah 42 I believe and he begins to talk about the covenant then with the Gentiles well this woman is a Gentile seeking the benefits of a covenant people without being in alignment with righteousness and many in the church do the same thing they're not under the righteous governance of the king but they want all the benefits of the kingdom and so she comes and she says it's not right it's not how it works But he's given her an opportunity. He's, given, he's just listening to the Holy Spirit, I believe, the whole time. You say, hey, it's not right. Kingdom doesn't go to the dogs. Dogs is just a Jewish word for Gentiles there. She knew it. He knew it. He was saying the kingdom belongs to the citizens of the king, the sons and daughters of the king. And she looks at him. I, I imagine this. Maybe this is my theological gymnastics, but I imagine her looking at him with a twinkle in her eye. And saying, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs. She's like, one day the covenant with the Jews will spread to the whole earth. And what is enough, just a little crumb of that will be enough for the nations of the earth. One day, one day I'll be able to get in in that covenant. Can I have it today? Can I have it today? One day the covenant will be for all. It will fall from the table at some point. But can I get in today? And what she does, what she cannot access by covenant as a non-Jew, she now accesses by faith in the new covenant that will be established upon Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension and enthronement. And she receives today the bread reserved for tomorrow. And that brings her into righteousness because Paul tells us that righteousness of the new covenant is not according to citizenship, but according to faith and she's like oh I can see a day coming when very just a crumb from that will be enough to feed the Gentile nations she doesn't protest and say how dare you call me a dog 
Wait till I tell my friends on Facebook what you told me. <laughs> Call yourself, right? She doesn't do any of that. By faith, she's able to discern in his voice that actually there's an invitation to go beyond the limitations of Gentile Jew and to step into a jurisdiction of new covenant where there is all one in Christ Jesus through faith in righteousness. Righteousness through his blood. Yeah. And Jesus answered her, verse 28, he said, woman, great is your faith. This is Matthew's I kind of, let it be to you as you desire. He says, for such a faith-filled reply, I'm adding those words in, you may go home. The demon has left your daughter. Does he cast it out? No. Does he speak to the demon at all? No. Is it an act of the kingdom? No. It is an act of righteousness. It is somebody coming into alignment with righteousness and that righteousness becomes a covenant righteousness that by grace, I believe, is extended to their home. Now, if we had time today, I could say to you, Paul argues the same thing when he talks about in 1 Corinthians 7 about the sanctified, the unsanctified husband and the children becoming clean because of the sanctified wife. It's the same principle, right? It's, hey, righteous covenant is now extending into the family. So it's a story, it's a slightly awkward story, it's a slightly insensitive story to the Western mind, but I tell you, it's an incredibly beautiful story that reveals the heart of God for righteousness, that removes all that is not right through righteousness. There's no throwing up in carpets, there's no screaming. Let me just call my family friend. Uh, I was chatting to him uh, a week and a half ago and uh, he was telling me, he's, he's 16 years old. <clears throat> he was telling me he was at a, a Christian gathering and uh, a boyfriend was there with his girlfriend and they were pretty sure she had some trauma problems or some troubles. And so he goes over and he begins to cast out the demon in the service and they ask him to leave. And they'd actually just had him speak on stage. So it wasn't like he was unknown to them. I'm not calling people out here. It's not my goal. What I'm trying to show to you is that the church would rather the lady left with the demon still in her than the meeting gets disturbed. There's something wrong there, people. Something badly wrong. When we would rather a daughter of the king goes out bondage and in pain and subject to demonic torment than have a little disturbance in a gathering because it doesn't fit somebody's dignity and it makes the rest of us uncomfortable. Like, what is wrong with us? What is wrong with it? Nobody would ever think going to a birth in the hospital and saying, that woman needs to keep quiet. I know it must be painful. <laughs> Nobody would think of saying that. Nobody would think of arriving at a car crash and saying, oh, it's far too bloody. We should take this off to a side room. This is life and death issues and we're treating them like psychology that's only been with us for about 70 years. God, what did we ever do? Thank God. 70 years ago, how, how did the church ever survive? Reducing the kingdom to the persuasion of man, the proclivities of man, the preferences of man, the psychologies of man, the prescriptions of man, when all the while the king waits with covenant righteousness to clothe us and remove from us the stain of our garment that we cannot remove from ourselves. It must cease. It must cease. We have to stop surrendering the church to the powers of the world and then hoping for power over those powers. And I believe it will. I believe God is doing that. So I believe as we close, we're gonna pray. I believe that one of the reasons the Bible gives this story is to give us hope for those of us who are tormented or those kids who are tormented. I believe it gives hope for every mother who's desperate for her addicted son or her broken daughter. I believe it's hope for every father who's struggling to connect, every kid who feels imprisoned. Imagine, imagine a kid knows there's something wrong and the church is saying to them, kids can't be demonized. All kids go to heaven. And the kid's getting tormented every night. And the church is saying to them, that's fine. Take the pill. Not the pill, but take a pill. 
And the kid is in torment and the mother's in torment. Justice must come. And justice, let me say this with holy reverence, justice will come upon those churches who turned away broken people in their need and presented to them psychology in the name of attracting more broken people. Oh, this is where my little Scottish Presbyterian could kick in ever so quickly. You say, it hasn't been there as much. It's really not. I'm so gentle with you, if you could see. But, but I am Scottish. And this is where that stuff could kick in. And, and I could say in a broad Scottish accent, they have healed the wounds of my people lightly. Pretending that there's not a deep wound and putting a superficial wound over broken sons and daughters is painful to the heart of the king. It wounds the heart of the king when his sons and daughters go home in bondage, when the house has no bread in it and will not share its crumbs for refusal to believe that it is sufficient. We've got to change people. We've got to stop packing out our churches with advertisement. Let me just speak to any pastor or leader who may be watching a stigmatized pastor and leader here. You've got to stop packing out your churches with advertisement. It is not the way to go. Social media may grow your platform, but it will bind your soul. It is not the way to go. It is not the way of righteousness. It is not the way of kingdom. We've got to change, and we've got to begin to set people free. And I believe that free people, free people. Free people, free people. So let's, let's go ahead, if you would, go ahead and stand. I want to I begin actually today with standing for those of us, firstly, if you sit for a moment. I want to begin. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Grand old Duke of York. When they were up, they were up. Um, I want to begin today by praying for those people today who know there's... there's um, wound and pain in your family and there's brokenness and torment. It may be your kid, it may be a, a nephew or a niece, it may be a cousin who are being bullied online and imprisoned and uh, all of that kind of stuff. And you know, you know this is more than is just a psychological disturbance. You feel like there's something at work here. If, if that's you, would you go ahead and stand? Just wherever you are. Are you standing on behalf of somebody else? <clears throat> Take 30 seconds on this to explain what it is that happens in this moment. The kingdom and its righteousness go forth. A king, a king when he waits and allows a request, extends his royal scepter, is the scepter of his righteousness. When that scepter goes out, it's the king saying, you may ask of me whatever you wish. Until that scepter goes out, you're in terror for your life that the king may take your life because you just don't approach the king on your terms. But there has been a scepter extended in righteousness through the blood of Christ today that means this, that the Father's heart is open to your request in this moment for that loved one because there is no more Jew or Gentile, slave or free in this. You get to come before the throne of grace boldly for that loved one today. And I want to encourage you as you stand on behalf of them now to begin to pray, but to pray with conviction rather than desperation, to appeal to the king's righteousness and his justice rather than to his emotion. But to actually say, Lord, your righteousness requires, your covenant requires a response to the works of evil in that individual's life. And I come today as a son or daughter and I come for freedom on behalf of another. And you take your place in this moment as an intercessor. Don't be put off by the word. You're just coming as a supplicant for the other. Saying, God, I want it for them. And my faith is in your righteousness today and in the power of your kingdom. And I want to encourage you now to begin to pray. And we want to pray for uh, different things in the room today. But this is where I think we start. This is kingdom order for this morning, I think. So go ahead, begin to pray for that loved one now. And we're going to pray together. <laughs> Father, we break off all bondage, all trauma, all trauma from COVID, all trauma from COVID broken and thrown off the hearts of young men and women, sons and daughters, those who um, ended up behind in their educational responsibilities, those who ended up behind in their emotional development today. Oh God, we come, we say, that isn't right, Lord. That isn't right. And you never work but apart from righteousness. Lord, you always work in righteousness. 
And so today, Father, we come boldly before the throne of grace where your scepter is reached out towards us in favor and we come clothed with authority and anointing and we ask for freedom and we ask for healing and we ask for wholeness to come to the hearts of sons and daughters and loved ones. And go ahead, you begin to pray. You just begin to pray, believing, believing that it would be done for you. That's it. Just pray. You can pray a little more passionately. Pray with conviction. Freedom. We speak freedom to the family. We speak freedom to the family. We command uh, online the torment to lift off your mind now in Jesus' name. We command what has been falsely and wrongly diagnosed now to be set right in the name of Jesus. We command freedom to come to your mind and to your heart and to your emotions now in Jesus' name. You will no longer lie in torment. Now, O oh Lord, King of the heavens, ah, the one who is present among us, come in greater measure, in greater power. And if you're not already standing, you may want to stand. Now we're going to break off some of these childhood areas that have been influenced and affected, that have become footholds for the enemy in our hearts, in our minds. I'm going to invite a couple of my friends to come. Mark and Ken, would you come? Both of whom are experienced in the area of bringing freedom to others. Oh God. Oh God, oh God. Now here's how we always start this in the one week we've done it. <laughs> we want to fully align ourselves with the king and his kingdom. And so we just start there and we just say, Jesus, all our loyalty is to you. You are our king. We yield ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves to you. We surrender our minds. We surrender our hearts, we surrender our thoughts, our appetites, our bodies to you today. We come. And if you don't know Jesus in this moment, if you've never opened your life to him, I would encourage you to do that now. To come under his lordship. Jesus, we acknowledge you as Lord. Lord of the heavens, who will come again in glory, judge the living and the dead. We appeal to your righteousness today as sons and daughters. And that's the first thing. The second thing that we do is we just repent. Oh, Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you would cleanse us for specific sin, for the sin of timidity, for the sin of fear, for the sin of psychological comfort, for leaning on that bruised reed that is Egypt, that psychological spirit that we felt would empower us to get through life. Lord, we repent today. We ask your forgiveness. You repent of specific things today. Before the Lord, you say, Lord, I ask your forgiveness. I ask that you would cleanse me by the blood of Jesus today, Father. Holy Spirit, would you come and apply the blood of Jesus to areas of addiction, to areas of brokenness, areas of sin. Cleanse me today. I repent. I renounce all wrongdoing. I take my stand against the unrighteousness today. And you just begin to pray those things. And we'll pray in freedom in a moment, for freedom in a moment. But all of this, all of this is by way of that. Then the third thing that we need to do is to confess unforgiveness if there's anything we hold against anyone. Because Jesus said, look, if you don't forgive someone, God won't forgive you. I said this a couple of weeks ago, and some of you might have been confused when I said that God's forgiveness is not unconditional. It is not unconditional. Jesus said, if you forgive them, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. And so today, so today you want to confess every area of unforgiveness and be done with that spirit of bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. And Lord, we ask, we ask that you would cleanse us from that. That's the starting point, that you would cleanse us from that. And if you're able to, you want to forgive, particularly those of you who have a wound right now from childhood of abuse, of molestation, of abandonment, of neglect. We want to pray real uh, 
clearly over those things now. Now, Lord, we uh, release your angelic presence in this room. We um, thank you that you alone are here, that no work of the enemy can enter or corrupt in any way. We thank you for your grace and your reverence now that begins to settle in our hearts. In your name, we take authority over the powers of malevolence, over the powers of abuse that abused that young man, that abused that young woman, over the tormenting spirit, over addiction and alcoholism in the home, over anger in the heart of a man, over domestic violence. And if any of those things for you are areas where you need to confess or forgive someone, this is the moment to do that. Lord, I forgive them for it. I forgive them for their words against me. I forgive them for their actions against me. I specifically forgive and then name the person under your breath, but name the person. I specifically forgive for the action there. And I ask that you would release them in mercy. And it would be, again, remiss of me not to at least instruct in this moment for 30 seconds and to say this. When you release forgiveness, what you're saying to God is, God, you alone, to you alone belongs vengeance. I will not take vengeance upon myself. To you alone belongs vengeance. And I will show mercy as you are merciful. But I trust the vengeance to you that you would do in your mercy what you choose. You release forgiveness. And now we're going to pray for freedom, healing and cleansing. And for some in the room, this may be really quiet, just as that passage was today. And for some, it may be like Mark 9 that we look at together next week. It might be loud. It doesn't matter. It's not important. What's important is wholeness and freedom. And so we're going to pray. And if you're aware, there are some wounds from your past. Maybe you've been going to therapy for years and you're still going. And again, I, please, if you're a therapist, please hear, I'm not against that. I just don't think it's unlimited in its power. It is severely limited in what it can do. And spiritually limited in what it can do. But if you're aware, there's some areas that have infected. And I just name them and then the guys are going to pray. But rejection... You're aware there's been a spirit of rejection, a posture of rejection over your life. You expect to be rejected. Or broken covenant, broken covenant in your marriage, broken covenant in your family. Your father and mother broke covenant together. They divorced and you were wounded by that. You may not be aware of that, but that's there. Alcoholism or addiction, if that was present in your family home growing up, I believe Jesus wants to set you free from that. Bullying. Bullying by a teacher, bullying by another kid that just wounded you. Jesus desires, Jesus Christ desires to set you free today. And so we're going to pray. And what I'm going to ask you to do, if you know for sure some of those things or many of those things are you, I'm going to ask you to come to the front. I don't want us to hide this stuff and I don't want us ever to feel ashamed any more than we'd feel ashamed going to the doctor. I, I just want to invite you to the front. Whatever, whatever it is, if any of those things you're like, I, I do need, I need that freedom. I need that healing. You can, you can get it where you are for sure, but I think there's something about just breaking this whole uh, back room, front room thing today. I think that, and I want to encourage you to stand if you come to the front, to stand, to lift your eyes towards heaven. That's where your help comes from. He is your helper and your deliverer. Lord, you are our deliverer. You are a restorer. I'm going to ask the guys to begin to play. If you're available, Jared and the team. I want to invite you just to come and press in. I believe, I thought this last week and I believe it this week, there are men in the room and you have an uncontrollable anger issue. This is a good time for you to come. 
Uh, honestly, the spirit of timidity has broken off of me, so I'm less afraid of that anger and that um, and demon now than I was two weeks ago. So I, I just, uh, if, if you're a man and you have, you may be a lady actually, I'm, I'm perhaps being sexist here and that's making you angry. Um, <laughs> You're a man or a lady, you have uncontrollable anger issues, you've known it, you just talk about your temper, you talk about it as though it's outside of your control, me and my temper, and you actually define it, that's probably a spirit and you probably need freedom from that. The Bible says man's anger does not bring about the righteousness God requires. And so you probably need some freedom. So just push in and lean in. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Father, I don't have bells and smells today. I don't have incense and candles. I don't have long lists of prayers that others have prayed. Today, Father, what we have, what we rely upon, what is our sole hope is Jesus Christ crucified, crucified, whose blood was shed for us, that the grave could not hold him because of his righteousness. But you, Father, raised him from the dead in glory. And you seated him at your right hand and you made him a promise, Father. You said, sit down, son, and rule and reign until your enemies become your footstool. And you will crush every enemy under his feet. And so, Father, I appeal in joy, in hope, and in faith as a son today, I appeal. And we as your body, as your bride, as your beloved, appeal today to your mercy. Come and be who you are. Come and liberate the captives. Come in the power of your blood and wash away all rejection, all fear, all demonic oppression, all torment, all anger. Now, now. I command you, unclean spirit, to lift off now in the name of Jesus. To come out now in the name of Jesus. You surreptitious spirit of anger, leave now in Jesus' name. You have cloaked yourself for far too long. Today righteousness expels you. Leave now in the name of Jesus. We command you to flee. We command you to flee. That spirit of, of sickness and torment, come out now in Jesus' name. Come out now. You powers of rejection, how dare you intimidate God's daughters? How dare you intimidate God's daughter? Come out now in Jesus' name. Come off now in Jesus' name. I command you to loosen your grip. I command you to loosen control now in the name of Jesus. Today we reject the spirit of rejection. We do unto you what you've done unto us. In Jesus' name, we reject you. We throw you out in Jesus' name. We inflict upon you your greatest fear. We cast you out by the spirit of the living God, by the spirit of the living God and the righteousness of God in Christ. We cast you out now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you will torment no more. You will afflict no more. Yes, the perfect love of God drives out all fear. And there is no fear in this house. God loves you with all of His heart. So fear, go now in the mighty name of Jesus. Fear, you have no place in this house. So I command you to leave in Jesus' name. So come, Lord, let your love flow into our hearts through your Holy Spirit right now. Lord, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning to the earth. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the evil one. Nothing at all shall harm you. But do not rejoice that the demons submit to you in my name, but your names are written in heaven. And right now your lives may feel like you're a city besieged by the enemy. You feel trapped in your spirit, in your soul, your emotions, your heart, your mind, your body. But the Lord is the, the Lord of breakthrough. He is Baal Parazim, the Lord of breakthrough, and He breaks through now. So we come against every oppressing spirit, every spirit of affliction, and we command you to leave right now in Jesus' name. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Right now, we release every trapped spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. We come against uh, the enemy of your soul. We break 
every hold, every fetter, every chain that the enemy has held around your soul, around your emotions, around your heart, around your mind right now. We break every fetter and every chain. Be free now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we come against every spirit of affliction or oppression over your body. And in Jesus' name, we drive out infirmities and afflictions that are caused by the demonic. We break the hold, we break the fetters. We say, be free now in Jesus' name. Every sickness and every disease that has been caused by the enemy, we break its power now in Jesus' name. Be free, be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. So come Holy Spirit more, let your kingdom come. Lord, let every uh, opposing spirit right now be broken in Jesus' Name. We nullify all the power of the evil one in this place. Be free in Jesus' Name. Jesus Christ sets you free and He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And I feel there's, there, there, are, there are ladies here who um, when you were younger, you were sexually abused and it has, it has affected your life, especially in the whole area of, of, of relationships. So right now, I just want specifically want to pray over anyone that was sexually abused as a, as a child. We break the fetter in Jesus and we break the chain. We break every ungodly tie. We break His power right now. We pray for the cleansing power of Jesus to release you from uh, the hold of the abusers. In Jesus' name, we set you free in the mighty name of Jesus and we release healing to your heart, to your mind, to your body. And the whole area of relationships, particularly with the obstacle, we pray healing now in Jesus' mighty name. Be free in Jesus' name. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's freedom in the house today. Come Holy Spirit, set the captives free. Father, I ask that you would come now and those that have been locked in bondage from self-judgment, feeling I'm never good enough, God won't use me, God can't set me free, God can't heal me, I break the power of self-judgments that we as Christians have believed that lie of the enemy that we're not good enough, that we can't receive from the Lord. And I break the power of that lie this morning in Jesus' name. I speak freedom from all condemnation. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Freedom from all self-judgment. You are worthy to receive. You are worthy. I break the power of lies. When we line up and accept the lies of the enemy, the enemy is a liar. We give that lie a foothold in our life. And when we keep believing that lie, it becomes the stronghold and opens the door for that demonic presence. And we take authority today over the lies of the enemy in our lives. All these lies, we say no to the lies. We renounce the lies that we've believed as truth. We say no to the lie and yes to you, Jesus. Yes to your truth. You created us in your image and we are worthy to receive. All those that have been struggling with bulimia, anorexia, body shame, I break the power of that off today in Jesus' holy name. Ashes for beauty. Freedom. Let your freedom come. Let your freedom come. And Father, those that have been influenced Through generational sins, we put the blood of Jesus on the sins of the ancestors that have fallen into our family line. And by the blood of Jesus, we claim freedom today. 
freedom today. Alcoholism, drugs, curses, abuse, trauma. We say freedom, no more to the enemy. And yes to you. Let your power come, Lord. Let your power come. Release. 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 Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee in terror. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So Father, we ask, Father, you said that you would give your spirit without limit. So Father, would you open wide the winds of heaven and pour out the oil of your anointing, the oil of your presence, the oil of deliverance in this house. Let it flow now. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. The increase of your kingdom. Let it, let it come, Heavenly Father. More God. More, more, more Lord. Increase in Jesus' Name. Every resisting spirit must go now in Jesus' Name and never return. In Jesus' Name, we drive out all oppression. We break every fetter, every chain. Be free in Jesus' Name. The torments of the mind, we break now. We command you to release the mind, the thinking in Jesus' Name. Be free in the mighty Name of Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Come Lord. So guys, we're going we're gonna to take a few moments. We're going to pray. And um, those standing and gathering, I'm going to ask if you're uh, one of our small group leaders and only our group leaders, or if you're somebody that we've said to you in the past, would you come and help us pray? Um, could you begin to come and help us pray? So we're praying generally from the front here, but we also want to pray specifically over individuals. So if you're one of our small group leaders, our team here, or we've had conversations in the past, and I just say, hey, when we do this kind of thing, would you help us pray? Uh, if you could come and begin to help us pray, that helps folks know who are receiving prayer, but actually the people praying for your people that we know and uh, have a measure of trust in. And so we're going to pray and um, we're going to sing. The Lord is going to minister as He has been already. Many of you yawning, many of you crying, just as the Lord begins to release things off your life. He's going to continue to do that, but He's going to do more as we begin to lean in personally. Uh, but while that's happening, uh, for those of you who want to stay, we're just going to sing a little while and just give some um, cover really to the prayer that we're praying over folks. So again, if you're part of our team here, if you're a small group leader, um, if you come, you just begin to pray over people. Uh, it may get a little noisier at this point and that's okay. That's okay, guys. Thank you so much. guys as you pray for people ideally men with men women with women you're asking for permission to place your hand on them and then you're binding all the work of the enemy releasing righteousness we definitely need some more women to come and help us pray some more group leaders Freedom come, freedom come. 